Guinness, a little drop of Ireland in a glass, a cultural icon of epic proportions, an acquired taste for some and a pint of black gold for others. We've all heard the sayings, my goodness, my Guinness, good things come to those who wait and Guinness is good for you. Now before you drink 8 pints and go for a 5k run, there's more to the black stuff, much more, 260 years more, brewing dynasty that travelled through the generations and sailed the great seas of a different world, on the way to becoming one of the most successful brands in the world, a velvet drink that creates memories and loses them. So where did this milkshake for adults come from? Arthur Guinness was the mastermind, and if your profile pic is a painting, you're old, really old. Born in 1725 near Selbridge, County Kildare, Arthur was likely exposed to the brewing of beer by his father, Richard, who worked as a landowner for the Archbishop of Cashel. Part of these duties included brewing the beer for the workers of the estate. The Archbishop was also Arthur's godfather, and on his deathbed, he left Arthur £100 in his will, some real coin in the mid-1700s. With this, Arthur set up a small brewery nearby, and in 1759, age 34, Arthur left the brewery to his younger brother and set off for the big smoke, Dublin. Sales at the time in the brewing industry in Dublin were not Dublin, probably more like halving. That's because the sales were being affected due to English beer being taxed less than the homegrown product. Nevertheless, old Arthur cracked on with his intention to open up a brewery and acquired a small, disused brewery at St. James's Gate in Dublin. The lease was signed on the 31st of December 1759 and was for 9,000 years at an annual rent of £45. I'm assuming inflation isn't involved here, but in the 1700s you'd have other things to worry about like syphilis or being run over by a horse. In fact, it is worth noting just how long ago 1759 is. The telephone has not been invented yet, and you're yelling out the window that you've just started a new business. Mozart is being pushed around in a pram, quietly humming. There is no United States of America yet, and the Miss World pageant is struggling to get off the ground. So this is the world that Arthur Guinness is operating in. And although Arthur started out making a good old-fashioned ale, there was a new kid on the block. A strong black beer called Porter that was being exported from London and it was proving popular. So he had a crack at making a version himself and it was a success. So much so that it was now being consumed in London and tables were turned. Arthur stopped making ales and concentrated solely on his own version of the dark Porter. As part of his lease agreement, he was to be granted free access to a water supply. A pretty savvy move on his part. Not all were happy with this arrangement, and in 1775, the Dublin Corporation tried to make him pay for this access. They sent the sheriff around with some heavies to turn the water off. Let's just say Arthur Guinness was hopping mad and was having none of it. He seized a pickaxe and threatened to go medieval if they did not leave. He won his battle and the brewery had their free water. Arthur Guinness was ahead of his time with employee benefits. Worker welfare was a theme with Guinness and there were plenty of socialised benefits for workers and their families. With health insurances, subsidised meals and pensions, even a pint after work. This was fairly uncommon at the time. Having seen his business go from strength to strength, in 1803, Arthur Guinness died, leaving the business to his son, Arthur Guinness II. The brewery has passed from father to son for five successive generations. With growth in exporting Guinness around the world, the name Guinness as well as the Harp logo was trademarked and the family were now a big noise in Irish society. By the end of the 19th century, Guinness had become the largest brewery in the world and was floated on the London Stock Exchange. Guinness Stout was now selling 1.2 million barrels a year. The brewery had gone from a small disused building to a 60-acre city within a city, its own railway and fire brigade. When World War I kicked off in 1914, there were 3,650 employees at the Guinness Brewery and employees were actively encouraged to sign up to the British Armed Forces. The company even paid half the wages to the soldiers' families and were guaranteed their jobs when they returned. It should have been if they returned. Out of 800 men that left to serve, 103 did not return. Guinness as a company also provided vehicles to the military. They even lost a steamship that was used to export Guinness to England when the ship was torpedoed and sunk in the Irish Sea on the 12th of October 1917. The war also hampered the availability of barley, as the government had restricted the growing of non-foodstuffs. The quantity and strength of beer was also restricted by the government, meaning the company had to reduce their production and the strength of the beer. These restrictions were not lifted until after the war was over. Guinness is synonymous with Ireland and Irish culture. Take the famous harp logo. This is based on the 14th century Irish harp. The harp can be seen on Irish coins, albeit slightly different from the trademark Guinness version. But a more well-known association is likely to be the 17th of March, or better known as St. Patrick's Day. The official day, it seems, for people outside of Ireland, at least, to dress in green and make very loose connections to their Irish heritage, while sipping, of course, a good old pint of the good stuff. As you would imagine, Guinness leans well into St. Patrick's Day. Of course, people 
people all over the world looking for an excuse to drink beer and be Irish. It would be rude not to. If you've been around for 260 plus years, there's going to be some well entrenched myths and legends swirling around the dark cloudy spectacle that has an acquaintance with many a generation. Old wives tales are rife about what Guinness can cure, and if you listen to everyone, it would be one hell of a list. So let's have a look at this one. Guinness is good for you. Back when advertising standards were pretty non-existent, Guinness had a slogan, Guinness is good for you. And there was some science and some anecdotal evidence. The anecdotal was more along the lines of, do you feel good after a pint of Guinness? Some people said, yes. As I said, non-existent advertising standards. But there was some science, as Guinness did contain iron. Iron is good for you. Guinness is good for you. New mothers were encouraged to drink Guinness by doctors that pointed to the iron and said that that would benefit recovery. Let's face it, we all hear what we want to hear. This was later dropped as a slogan by Guinness and replaced with more ambiguous slogans implying if you drink Guinness, you get stronger. A little bit like an adult version of eating all your greens. Guinness today doesn't make any claims of Guinness being good for you, although there is more modern science to show there are benefits and point to antioxidant compounds that are present in dark stouts as well as things like red wine and chocolate. So there are benefits and you can hear what you want to. And in this case, pubs are basically wellness centers. We're not quite finished with the science. Follow the nerd. We're going molecular. The Guinness we know today has a smooth, creamy, velvet-like texture. This is the result of nitrogen, as opposed to our purely carbonated ale or lager. And this also is the reason for a dense and longer lasting head on the pint as the nitrogen bubbles are smaller. The small sinking bubbles you see as the drink is poured is a result of the nitrogen bubbles meeting resistance on the glass and the bubbles in the center rising without resistance, so causing a circular motion to occur. This happens in general with other liquids, however most beers are carbonated and carbon dioxide dissolves into liquid more easily than nitrogen. The contrast of the dark Guinness and the light bubbles make it visually more noticeable. Guinness has plenty of variations of the Guinness Stout, but there is also various additional products that share the famous name. There is Guinness Nitro IPA, an American only IPA, and Guinness Blonde American Lager, Foreign Extra Stout, West Indies Porter, Pale Ale, Golden Ale, and Hop House 13, a lager named after a hop storage building at the St. James's Gate Brewery. Guinness is now under the control of Diageo, a company that formed as a result of a merger in 1997 by Guinness Brewery and Grand Metropolitan, a former leisure business that had a history of hotels, pubs and entertainment venues. Diageo is now a beverage company with a wide range of alcoholic brands and has significant portfolio of well-known spirits. Diageo had a revenue of over £12 billion in 2019, and Guinness is still a major brand for them. Every day, 10 million pints of Guinness are sold, and the secret ingredients, water, malted and roasted barley, hops and yeast. The roasting results in a colour that is technically ruby red rather than black. Marketing today. A pint of Guinness has more theatre than your average pint of ale. And if you've been stood around thirsty for roughly 119.53 seconds, then this is apparently a big part of pouring the perfect pint, according to Guinness. Which fits nicely with their good things come to those who wait slogan. Held at a 45 degree angle and poured in a double pour, two step method that allows the person behind the bar to wander off three quarters of the way through to pursue other interests. The reason for this elaborate piece of theatre, some have argued is more of a specious bit of marketing and the the reason for the double pour has not been needed for many a decade and was originally needed because two casks, one old and one new, were used when pouring. When Guinness switched to a nitrogen based solution, they apparently wanted to keep what the customer already knew because people don't like change. Guinness World Records, or the Guinness Book of Records, depending on how old you are, is an annually published record of mainly human, but not always, world records. Sir Hugh Beaver, the managing director at the time of Guinness Breweries in 1951, commissioned the book to be made to help settle debates that people would have in a pub. The Guinness Book of Records was a huge hit commercially and culturally, and I hope you're sitting down for this one. The book itself became a world record for world's best-selling copyrighted book. With the advent of the internet, physical book sales started to wane, as people could look up information online without the need for a big book that was released once a year. Nowadays, Guinness World Records has added alternative revenue streams. For example, now you can pay for what is effectively a consultant's fee to the Guinness World Records, and they will assist you in your attempt to break some kind of hula hooping record by speeding up the process and providing adjudicators. They can even provide advice on records that you can try if hula hooping isn't your thing. Keeping up with the international theme, Guinness is now brewed in 49 countries worldwide and sold in over 150 countries. It's very Irish of drinks, this instantly recognisable icon of Ireland is actually sold more in Great Britain than anywhere else, with Ireland being second. But something that stands out when looking at where Guinness is popular is Africa. African countries feature heavily on the top 10 list of Guinness drinking countries. Nigeria is number three in the world Cameroon is number 5, followed by Kenya at 6, and Ghana at number 7.
A big reason for this is Guinness was prepared to export and find new markets very early on, where others were perhaps less willing. Guinness was also more adapted to travel for longer, which was necessary for travel by sea. The British Empire was also a factor. Guinness was being consumed in Africa as early as 1827. The Guinness that is consumed in Africa, Asia and the Caribbean is a slight variant and is known as Guinness Foreign Extra Stout. The difference is that it has more hops and a higher alcohol level, typically 50% stronger, than the draft equivalent in Ireland or Britain. This was so it was able to travel better in the early days of exporting, so Guinness is very much a big part of African culture too. Cheers! So the next time you're in your local pub, stroke wellness centre, pondering what hula hooping world record you plan on breaking, or the molecular activity swirling around the glass you're staring at, while you wait 119.53 seconds for your health shake to be ready, remember that there is over 260 years worth of people in that glass. Not literally though, that would be gross. All things Guinness, let me know. Thanks for watching.